things? The volume. Volume is good? Yep. Excellent. All right. Time to start. I'll uh, introduce myself. Maximum Vitara. I've uh, come from a very long background of conservation. I was working for Greenpeace when I was about 19 and went on into rainforest regeneration, which I did about 13 years of, and worked in rainforest rescue for about four years. So spent quite a bit of time at this place and then uh, exited with uh, first class honours and then I've started in the last year working for Rainforest Trust Australia. And Rainforest Trust, you may not have heard a lot about it yet, but it's an international organisation with a goal of buying back enormous tracts of rainforest that are then put into national parks and protected in the extreme long term. So there's been maybe 17 million acres bought back thus far around the world. So they, they have a significant donor base, and they're just here in Australia for us to, to meet the rest of them. Uh, so the topic of the talk is, is about genetic diversity, and genetic diversity is what makes us slightly different from each other, but it's what gives us resilience as a group, not as individuals. It's because a virus might come through that wipes me out, but someone out there won't be affected by it the way I was, and that person will carry my species on. So genetic diversity is about being able to cope with various stressors that will come and affect your population one day. That could be climate change or it, or it could be a virus or something like that. And what we did in this research is we spent two years looking for the oldest rainforest trees we could find in the Byron Shire. And we wanted to identify what sort of diversity they had on the genetic level and then we compared that with the, cers the, uh, the, the seedlings that we were producing at rainforest tree nurseries. Uh, and obviously that's because in the Byron Shire, we have lost, thank you. In the Byron Shire, we've lost almost all of our original rainforest. We had 75,000 hectares, and we were left with 556 hectares. Uh, and, and that's in about 33 to 40 remnants. So these are all fragmented and quite some distance apart. So finding populations of trees for, for a science, you know, for a scientifically valid study was pretty difficult uh, in these conditions. Uh, there's obviously quite a lot of species. We've got 290 tree and shrub species and uh, 81 vine and 83 non-woody. So you know, 454 plant species in our rainforest down there. And uh, and like I said earlier, there's only 556 remaining hectares. So we, we were concerned that with all of this destruction that these species would have lost the diversity that they once had, the diversity that survived this forest for millions of years, this one vine and remnant. Conservation genetics is very concerned about small populations. For it, for conservation genetics, if you have 50 or 100 individuals, you're in a lot of trouble as a species. And what is recommended is about 4,500 individuals. This varies very slightly in the literature. Most authors agree, if you're going to survive as a species, there's got to be at least 4,000 of you. Now, here we come into the issue with degraded, fragmented forest. Now, I'm just... For this calculation, I'm just going to assume that in mature, contiguous, untouched rainforest, that there's a tree every three metres, okay? In, in mature forest, never been touched. Now that should be just over a thousand mature trees in each hectare. Now I'm being generous there because a lot of authors from tropical and subtropical forest will say 600 or 700 trees per hectare, okay? So I'm saying lots of trees per hectare. And if there was this many trees per hectare, there should have been about 617,000 tree survivors in the big scrub when it was first decimated. 617,000 trees. But you've got to divide that by the species. 
So this many trees, but that many species. So the more species that survive, the more you have to divide it up when you count just the number of individuals of each species. And it turns out that if it's, it would be on average just over 2,000 individuals would have survived of each species if they were averaged. About 2,000. So it's just under half of what's recommended in conservation genetics. It's just under half. So we can assume that if you wipe out almost 100% of the landscape, it's fragmented, there's less than half of the recommended minimum, you can assume that you've lost some genetic diversity. You can assume that some, there's been some loss. It's just under half of the minimum, and it's just under 5% of the recommended number of surviving trees in conservation genetics. This is what 2100 dots looks like. Now, if you think about rainforests, we're, we're talking about these phenomenal um, ecosystems, these great, grand, complex things. That is not many survivors of the species, is it? It's quite easy to capture it in your eye and say, that's it, that's all that's left of each species. And like I told you, they're fragmented into many pockets that often can't pollinate or can't, can't you know, they can't share genes one way or another. There's, they might not have uh, bird dispersal, for example. So not only is there a few survivors, they're fragmented, and they're being forced to inbreed. So some species, you can fragment them and they just don't care. They'll be spread by bats for hundreds of kilometers, they'll be fine. But other species can't do that. They have short range pollination and short range dispersal. And those species are the ones that I worry about the most because they're gonna be forced to inbreed. And they, they suffer inbreeding, plants suffer inbreeding the same way that everything else does. If it happens for one generation, the tree might not grow very strong, or it might not set much fruit. But if you inbreed a species for multiple generations, it can just die. Okay? And of course, the next concern is that if a lot of genetic diversity has been lost, and few individuals survive, and few genes survive, when climate change comes through, it'll bring a whole new stress to these plant communities. And if there's not many resilient options in their gene pool, it's another stressor that could wipe out species. So this is all, it's, it's an unfortunate sequence of events, but I'm not going to end on a bad note. This, this here, 10 to the minus 9, right? This is telling you that if we want these small number of survivors to, to produce new genetic diversity, we're going to be waiting a long time. 10 to the minus 9 is like saying, you know, there's a, there's a 1 in, in a million or 1 in 10 million chance that you're going to produce a new gene per generation. So I'll give you an example. Man and woman had a child. That child might have 30 genes that are different, 30 gene sequences, little, one spot on their DNA. 30 might be different to their parents. 30 out of 3.2 billion genes. We have 3.2 billion genes, and you get this tiny little difference in one generation. So the thing is, we can't afford for the forest to be fragmented. We can't afford for them to be inbreeding, and we can't afford to lose any more diversity. The individuals of species have to be interbreeding and, and reconnected because we can't wait for millions of years for new genes to evolve. We don't have that time. We have 100 years or 50 years. So uh, earlier I said that an average of 2,100 survivors might have uh, occurred in the big scrub down south, okay? But there's, it's, uh, there's always species that are more common than others. There's always more common species. So what I'm saying here is if, if it's 2,100 survivors, well, the green species, well, they might have been really common, okay? So there's 4.2 4 thousand of them. And this red species, well, they, they might have already been niche and rare when we arrived here in Australia. So maybe only 30 and so on. So this is what 2,100 average survivors might really look like. 
two and a half thousand, one and a half, and so on. But this is this is where fragmentation is such a destructive force for rainforests or for all forests, because in fragmentation, it really looks like that. This this four thousand two hundred individuals should have a uh, uh, population. They should have had enough to survive as a species. They should have been enough diversity left. But if they're in just three groups that can't breed together, can you see they fall below the line? This is where we really have to focus on saving species. We need to be aware where, where there's huge distances of paddock or, or roads or things we've done. We need to be aware where species are being separated, separated from each other. Because these are now doing it alone. These, these groups are now doing it alone. So reconnecting them is of prime importance. And this is why fragmentation is such a concern. So what happens when we try and regenerate the forest? What happens is, is, I can guarantee you we've lost diversity from the destruction of the past. Um, especially where you've got less than a percent of your ecosystem left. So we've lost diversity, which means we don't, as a population, as a, if you just imagine each species of tree, as a population they don't have the same resilience to different threats that they used to have. And who here, has seen someone collect a hundred or a thousand trees off, uh, seeds off a single tree. We've all done it. <laughs> we've all done it. Okay. So if we collect, if, if we've been reduced to fragments and they're small and there's not many trees to collect from, and then we always go to our favourite tree on the corner to get seed, we're making the problem worse if we do that. We have to collect widely and we, and we know there's an issue there. Um, and yet, if, if we're doing this, if we're not collecting from our parent trees, there's quite a concern that we're lowering the diversity even more. When we reforest, we could be making the problem worse. So in my research question, I was asking, well, have we made it worse? Are our nursery seedlings less diverse than the oldest trees I could find? So I compared the DNA, I went into the oldest uh, piece of forest I could find, and compared it with our three, Biggest nurseries. Is it possible, sorry, Liz, can I just take this off? Yeah, I'm just finding it very distracting. I should be able to talk about that. <laughs> okay, so for this comparison, I went to the Big Scrub Flora Reserve. It's the biggest remnant patch of forest we have. It's incredible. It's magnificent. Most of these photos, uh, my partner and I took ourselves. Many rare things have been spotted there. It, it's the biggest remnant we have. So I said we've got 556 hectares and 148 is in just this remnant. 181 of our tree and shrub species. It's, we only have 290 tree and shrub species. And there was a bit of logging there, but for the most part, this, this remnant was a really good place to search. And we looked at species that are very common. We were, we, when we wanted to prove this point that we were losing diversity in our regeneration, uh, we wanted to fight clean. We wanted to tie one hand behind our back and be straight up. So we picked three extremely common species to be fair, so that we weren't selecting trees that we know people struggle to collect from. These are all over the place, and, and you, I'm sure you all know them. The strangler fig, the native tamarind, and the white bouillon. They're ubiquitous. So these are the species we studied. We also chose them because they disperse differently, so they give us a, something interesting to look at. Now, sampling fresh DNA from ancient trees, I, I'm, I'm talking really big trees that we found, is a bit of a problem because these really big trees might not have leaves for the first 40 metres. 
And you can't get DNA from fallen leaves because it starts to break down straight away. You can't do it, not for, the, not for genetic analysis. So we had to find a projectile that could hit the canopy and get fresh leaves for us that we could take straight to the lab. This was seriously hard work. We, we invented 18 methods of collection. <laughs> um, some of these were pretty incredible contraptions. We had a, we had a six foot tall, two man slingshot. And by the time you've flown 50 meters through the air, there's no, the, the, the projectile, of course. There's, <laughs> there's, um, there's no power behind it. So you can, you can fire a projectile with great force, but by the time it gets up there, it does nothing. So, um, and the bigger the projectile, the more air resistance. And then, as a university, we were saying, well, how do farmers sample leaves from the canopy? And they're using guns. Are you good luck getting a license to use a gun for a university study? So then I, I called the top rainforest scientists in Australia, and I said, well, how do you do this? And they said, oh, just use a one-handed slingshot from eBay. Because they, they, they have no idea of the size of these trees. These 50 meter trees I'm seeing. So we were in for a bit of trouble. So I got this drone and I, I built a uniaxial joint and an engine onto it with this long rod. It's a flying brush cutter, okay? A flying brush cutter with a remote control. And I was inspired by a xanthopan from, um, from uh, Darwin's stories, if you remember. So flying brush cutter. Um, we got a few samples like this. Then I built from scratch a heavy drone, um, almost the size of this projector screen. I was terrified of it. Uh, everyone was terrified of it. Uh, pretty dangerous, pretty loud thing. Um, that cut about 30%. We got about 30% of our samples that way. This is expensive, and I don't even want to talk about the time consuming. These were working to some degree, but you know what's really good for getting leaf samples out of trees? Potato cannon. Yeah, amazing. A potato cannon, it's basically um, a BBC pipe, you ram a, a, a dead potato in it, you put some gas into it, you click a little zapper, and it shoots it at high speed and it knocks leaves down. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, again, you probably do need a license. So, this, um, this saved me, I was sweating bullets for a year thinking I'm not going to be able to get samples, but it, this worked. This is really, it's funny, but it really works. This, this is accurate, knocks leaves down, and it got us the DNA. So uh, these dots, obviously the blue is for white bouillon and green for fig, and etc. These show you where we collected from. These are where we found the big trees. They're mostly along the creek lines where they could just drink water all day. Yeah? Mostly along the creek lines in the reserve. Uh, and there are patches I couldn't collect from because this, this here is regen and this here, even though you can't tell, this is eucalypt. So we sampled, we sampled quite widely uh, and we got a lot of samples. We got a lot of samples. So from the reserve we got about 26 or 27 of each species. And then we went to the three biggest nurseries in Byron and depending on what was available we got up to 24 of each species or as low as 18. It just depends what was available. So in total, we did 284 DNA extractions. We looked at the DNA of 284 trees, which is plenty to make a point. So how do we do this? Well, we did this with pretty new technology you might not have heard of. So you take the DNA strand and you fire sound at it, and it splits the DNA up into pieces. It shears the DNA. So, but now you've got little pieces of DNA, you've still got no idea what's on it. No idea at all. So then we add dye. So there's four codes to our DNA, yeah? A, T, G, and C. That makes all the codes for our life. And we have four dyes that will only stick to each code. So what happens is, is you pour the dyes in, and then you the dyes stick to the DNA, only to the code that it sticks to, one for each. Then you fire a laser at it. And when you hit the DNA with a laser, the light that comes back lights up the DNA like a colorful piano. And you can see every single piece. And you can tell what's written on the DNA. And from this, you can tell differences between individuals. So what we use is um, stutters. So our DNA stutters 
between generations. It reads, it has to photocopy itself to make another, to make another you. But when it does the photocopying, there are these spots in the DNA that are really repetitive and the DNA gets confused when it's reading its own material. Now these spots on the DNA where it gets tongue-tied trying to photocopy itself, they're called microsatellites and they're really sensitive markers because they change much more often than all the important stuff in your DNA that takes millions of years, like I said before. So you can use these to tell differences really easily. Now, just look at this blue bit right here where my hand is. ta da ta da ta da ta ta Now, if I say ta da ta da ta da ta 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 you don't know how many times I said ta Yeah? yeah. So when it reads it, sometimes it will go ta da 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 ta and stick just one more on the end. And now you can tell the difference between father and son. Do you see? It just gets tongue-tied per generation. Happens a lot. So what we did is we, we looked at the genome of these things and we, we stuck something on the front of it and we stuck something on the back of these spots and then we photocopied them up. We got lots of photocopies to tell dad from son, yeah? And cousin from from um, cousin. And what happens is, is that this is shorter than this, yeah? So you can see dad and you can see son because it's longer. So this is really common. A lot of people are using microsatellites. So the other thing is because this is a university study, there's always this issue of money. So we multiplexed. So when you multiplex, you can look at different parts of a genome at the same time. And it makes it a lot cheaper, and it saves me from punching over like this with a pipette for 10 hours. It's quicker, and all the genetic scientists are supported because the manufacturers make it for us. And what you can do is you can get orange dye and tag this one on one spot of your DNA and get blue dye and tag this one on another spot of your DNA. You can do four at a time. They've just got to be different color tags and different lengths. These, these spots on the DNA that repeat themselves. So yeah, we could photocopy different spots at once and look at different parts of the genome of these trees at the same time and start to see if there's a difference between the groups. Now, Having, having data that is scientifically valid is, is always like it's the crunch point of scientific research. It's how did you get your data? Was, it, you know, was there anything wrong with how you did it? We got really fastidious and it, because we were often comparing um, the diversity of 26 individuals with the diversity of 18. Well, that's not fair because there's more of them, yeah? So more will have more diversity. So we had to make it fair. So to make it fair, we we'd sample a random 18 from this 26 many, 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 many times so we could compare fairly with the 18 we got from nursery A. And then if we had 22 from nursery B, we'd take a random 22 out of that many times, 10,000 times. So we were very fair in our comparison. This is, this is really fastidious what we did. Don't look at this. Don't look at it. All I want you to look at is all the red. Everywhere you see a red is where we were right. Yeah, I'll go on to, we won't spend too much time on these ones. Blue shows you the genetic diversity of white bouillon coming out of our nurseries. Red shows you the diversity that I got from one remnant. Not sampled from all over the place like the nurseries do. One remnant had as much as twice the diversity. Now, in terms, of, in terms of genetics, that's an atrocity. You don't, you don't want to lose that much diversity from the old trees to just now in what we're producing. That's, that's really bad. We have to do better than this. You can't afford to halve the diversity. These things have to live for millions of years, not just for us. Now, follow the orange line at the top. The orange line at the top tells you uh, how well the genes are distributed amongst individuals. 
And as you can see, in the bush, it's really high. Yeah? In the bush, the diversity is really well spread out. And amongst the population, so imagine all your trees in the bush. Amongst all the trees in the bush, the, divert, the red bar here shows you it's really spread out amongst the group as well. Now look at how spread out the genes are in the nurseries. They're not very spread out. So to give you a really clear explanation of what this shows you, is that, um, if, let's use us, let's use us, okay? If this is a low red bar here, it's like having everyone here being Anglo-Saxon and three black people in the corner. That's what that means. This means that there's all sorts of people. There's some Asians here, there's some Greeks there, there's some Anglos here, okay? That's what this means. It means the diversity is spread all over the room and it's great because it means that the, 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 the whole population of trees can adapt together really well. But there was something here I wasn't expecting, and that's the good thing in science, is when you find something you didn't look for. See all the purple? Mm -hmm. Each nursery and my collection had genes that no one else had. Everyone was capturing some genes that no one else found, and this is what's exciting about this study. So let's go on to the next species. That's, that's your white bouillon. Now let's look at strangler feet. Two of the three nurseries were far lower in diversity than the old trees I found. But it was better. It was better than the white bouillon because white bouillon is, has a Samara, wind distributed. Figs, figs have a great passport. We've kept them alive in our paddocks all across the coast. The birds and the bats spread them like wild. The figs are doing better but the nurseries are still behind as a general rule. Even with a species that is well distributed. Now what's interesting is, can you see that nursery B here is almost as good as the floor reserve? Do you know what nursery B do? They collect fig seeds from all over the coast. They are not just doing local provenance. They have increased the genetic diversity by allowing people to send in seeds in the mail, etc., from a greater area. That's how they've become so good and so strong. Let's just move along. Now to my final species, the Diplodotus australis. Now, I couldn't sample, uh, I couldn't produce the data from the third nursery here. I'm, it's my opinion from my research that there may be a subspecies that we've not identified, that I found genetically. But I, I couldn't put it in this paper. It's, I had to leave it out. So what I've compared here is just two nurseries with, um, with the floor reserve. And as you can see, the diversity in the floor reserve is as much as double as what it is in the nurseries. And look at how well spread out the genes are many private genes that were only found in the bush where I went, many of them in purple and red, they were, the genes that this population had were really well spread amongst them. Nursery B, it's almost as if one side of the room had one gene and the other side of the room had the other gene. There's no, this is, there's no diversity here. Yeah. So this is, we need to do better than this. We need to help our nurseries by giving them seed from many trees. Now what you're looking at here, just focus on this left one, the white bouillon. The blue bars, the blue bars show you the diversity of white bouillon at each nursery, okay? The green bar shows you what happens to your diversity if you take seeds from each nursery and put them together and plant them as a group. It's a solution. If you mix the seed from different nurseries, if you're doing a planting, mix them together. As long as the provenance isn't crazy far away, if it's reasonably close, mix the nursery seeds together, combine your efforts, and you start to compete with the ancient bush. 
look at stranglerific now. Second option. The blue bars show you the diversity from each nursery. When we combined them, they were more diverse mm. than the old forest. This is from one old forest, remember? And remember with the strangler fig, they were collecting seed from all over the coast. So in this instance, we could make it better than what was left. And in the native tamarind, same sort of story. The blue bars show you the diversity, and the green is a lot better. So we have a solution. We, we have to help each other more, basically. We have to help each other out more. And I, I took the time to see, well, how many parent trees were they actually collecting from in these nurseries? Well, it wasn't great. It was, it was between four and eight parent trees minimum. Yeah, so for, the, for nursery A, the yellow, you know, four, seven, or eight parent trees for each species and so on. So it's not a lot of parent trees. And how many should it be? Does anyone know how many it should be? Did someone say 50? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, 50 would be nice. The minimum, if you look at the whole world, there's regen happening all over the world. Even in my native Lebanon, they're doing regen and they're planting 65 million trees. Everyone's doing regen. 20 to 30 parent trees minimum. And we're using four to eight. That's, there's the part of the problem there, um, and there's many countries that say 50 trees minimum that you collect from, or as many as you can get. The problem with Australia is our guidelines were set really low a long time ago. That we were told to collect from 10 to 20 trees. No one in the world agrees with that. It's just, I don't know how it happened in Australia, but it happened a long time ago. You'll find Germany, Spain, look, look everywhere. 20 to 30 minimum, not 10 to 20. Now I want to tell you something. Um, these are the sort of things you find in science that surprise you. Um, this is where the trees were collected. So these are white bouillon trees, and they've just got a number next to them. So wherever you see a circle, there's a white bouillon tree in the bush. Now, you see all these blue ones? These are all half, these are all half brothers. And these two green ones, they're, they're brother and sister. Okay? Now, the, the two green ones are pretty close, and the three blue ones are pretty close, and they're close family. Isn't this what you expect? If you're close together, you're going to be more related? It's not that simple. White Booyong 16 and 10 are about a kilometre apart and they're half siblings. White Booyong 2 is half siblings with 9. Another kilometre apart, half siblings. Not related at all here. So where you see the lines, any colour, where you see the lines drawn between, drawn between trees, they're related. It's not clear. They could be far apart and have nothing to do with each other. So these, these guys are way up in the corner and they don't have any kinship. Sometimes close trees are related, sometimes far trees are related. The only way around this, the only way around this is to collect from a large number. You can never be sure. I'll show you with the fig. This is even weirder. So fig 14, 3 and 7. These are like mother, son, and brother, basically. The fig, uh, I think it's fig 14. This is one of those enormous ones, like 15 meters around the, the body. It's a huge tree. So this is probably the parent of, of, of the fig three. So they're, they're pretty close and they're related. And fig 15 and 19, they're pretty close and they're related. But you know what else is happening here? 18, 12, and 26 are all half brother. <laughs> and that would take you like four hours to hike between. And you'll also notice that most of the trees that are close to each other don't have a line between them. Most of them. If they're close, there's no lines. I don't know what's going on here. It, it, maybe it's the figs, uh, the fig bats. Maybe the bats are eating the figs and when they get off a tree, they don't want to land for a while before they drop their seed. But for some reason, when they're close together, they're not related. Who would have thought? You know, it's 
it doesn't always make sense. And, and again, the solution is to collect from large numbers of trees. So what did we find? That in every single case, the single remnant that I collected from was more diverse than what was coming out of the nurseries. In every case. Every single collection that anyone had done was valuable. Every single collection was great because everyone brought genes to the table that they were going out and finding in the forest and bringing into our nurseries. Everything is helping. There's no good way to do this. We have to help each other. When you combine the collections from each nursery, you will make a stronger planting. When that planting, when you put that in the ground and those trees mate with each other, they will have the, the most diverse offspring that you can muster. So when we do regeneration, which we've got to work together with the nurseries, get buy a bit from each nursery you've got and put them together. We are not collecting from enough remnant trees because they're too tall and it's too hard to get seed off them. You've got to collect from the old trees. They've got the most diversity. Don't, don't let it happen that you see a short homolanthus and go, oh, beauty, there's fruit all over it. There's lots of people who just go and collect from regen trees. We can't do that. We've got to go and get seed from the old trees. Now, as much as I don't want to say this, there's already going to be species that are inbreeding and dying out. You've probably seen species that don't fruit properly or, or, or are not very robust. Some of our species are probably going to die. I don't know how long it'll take. But uh, given the number of species that have gone through the destruction of the big scrub, you've probably had similar things up here in Noosa. There are probably some species that are going to genetically deteriorate and disappear. And this, you might not be able to do anything about it naturally. So the solution is to mix it up. Now I want to get to something important just before we finish this one. The species I chose are ubiquitous. Most of you probably know all three of them. This is the dangerous part of what I'm saying. These were common species. If these species are not being looked after genetically and we find them everywhere, what's happening to the other species that we don't know where to find them? Well, there's only one rosewood tree that you know on that hill and there's only one, one of those polycyas trees. That's a huge problem. If the common species are suffering, we've got to take more time, more care to find the rare ones. So they're harder to find the rare trees. And as I suggest, if you're, a, if you're rare, there's already going to be less diversity because you're rare. There's not many of you to have this. You can only hold so many genes in your own body, right? If you're rare, the, your species will have low diversity. And if you're rare, it's, it's even more likely that you've been fragmented apart and you can't reach each other because a pollinator can only travel so far. Yeah? Your dispersal can only go so far. So the rare trees we're really going to look after in this genetic way. Now, the thing that bothers me the most is we're not putting in the effort to get seed off the big old trees. We have to do it before they die. Because these big old trees, they might only live a few hundred years and there's some remnant trees left from that survived the destruction of the 1850s. Now when they're gone, their genes are gone with them. And if we haven't collected them, they're gone forever. So we've got to find more time and energy to collect from the old trees and build up seed banks from them before they pass. Uh, a lot of people help with this. Uh, a lot of scientists and people I haven't even mentioned. Uh, yeah, I'd really like to send my thanks to them all. This was not this was not an all two years of research. We had a lot of resources on hand, and I have a lot to appreciate. Thank you for that. The end of the first presentation.